Welcome to Into Pittsburgh. I'm Christopher Whitlatch, your host, and today we're catching up on Ataxia. And joining me again, uh, he was with us last year, is Ed Schwartz. And with him is Rini Kuhlman. And we're going to get up to date on the latest, latest developments of Ataxia research. <laughs> Thank you. Ed, welcome back. It's great yes. to have you Good. again. I wonder if you'd tell us um, again what ataxia is. Okay. Ataxia is a, uh, a nerve muscular condition, neuromuscular condition, that uh, can be uh, something that anybody of any age or either sex can be afflicted with. Uh, it affects motor skills such as walk and coordination in the hands. Uh, I'm afflicted, she is not. Uh, I have neuropathy in my hands. You will know since I was here last time that my voice is somewhat affected and uh, I'm no longer walking. I'm confined to a wheelchair now. And this is just the nature of the disease. It is different for every person. It comes on differently for everybody, and it's very hard to diagnose. I'm glad you, uh, I was gonna ask you if you would uh, bring us up to date on, on your condition since it's been about a year since you were on the show. Were yes. there any other changes to your condition over that period of time? Uh, those are the big ones. Uh, it is not uncommon for people to have broken bones because we fall a lot. Mm -hmm. And I have started falling. And just before Christmas, I got my leg tangled up between a door casing and the, uh, my powered wheelchair, and I broke my left leg. Oh, my. And then I moved from a broken leg uh, to a condition where I ended up having a, a more nervous condition in my stomach than I had had before. And uh, I just recently got out of the hospital because I had an, a bad tooth, which is anybody's problem. <laughs> but while they put me in there, they found out that I had a blood clot. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I was down for a week in the hospital. Then I had to go through rehab again, so I just got out of the hospital after two weeks of rehab. Uh, they call it physical therapy. They also call it occupational therapy, teach you how to get around the house. Mm -hmm. And I had voice therapy. Oh. <laughs> so, been an interesting year. Interesting. Yes, yes. But it seems like nothing gets gets you gets you down here. Uh, um, you were recently uh, both of you at a conference in Philadelphia. Yes. Can you bring us up to date about maybe some of the um, ongoing developments in ataxia research? Well, the uh, the biggest thing that I see is this. Uh, first of all, in research for all of the medical areas, they do a lot of research first on mice or other animals to test that. They're doing a, a tremendous amount of research in that area, and I didn't realize just exactly how much until we both had the opportunity to go through a room that had poster boards that were set up by each person doing their research. And there must have been 75 poster boards, maybe? Yes, quite a now, bit. Excuse me. I've been out to pit and gone through theirs, mm -hmm. and I bet they have 200. <laughs> so 
they do a lot more than you do. The other thing is that once you get a drug that shows some possibility in the research animal, you start doing using the drug on a human who is willing to try that. And her sister is doing that, and we're expecting to see a lot more of this come to fruition now. And our organization is small, but we're spending about a million dollars a year. We uh, have maybe a third the number of people that have ALS, but we have significantly less money than mm -hmm. they are able to attract. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Do you have a similar status for, for the, the drugs as well? Is it, um, is it accelerated human trials where... Um, we're just getting into that area. Okay. So I think, um, to, to jump off of what Ed was saying, in the United States, there are 150,000 known people that have ataxia or a form of ataxia. Um, that is um, about three times more people than have ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So there's a very big awareness problem. And a lot, is, as you know, funds go towards those diseases that definitely make more um, noise, mm -hmm. especially in the research community. So what we're really trying to do is sort of bring us up to par. And the, the interesting and I think the most um, empowering thing for us that came out of us attending the conference last week is that we're getting there with the research. We're raising more, more awareness. Um, we're raising more funds in, um, as a result of that. And therefore, we're able to use that money to really get out there. So the basic science has been there for a long time, and we've been really kind of building on that, but we're starting to go to clinical trial now with the drugs. We had the first clinical trial go um, last year um, into um, it, out in the field. Um, as he mentioned, um, not my sister, but my aunt, um, Mary yes. Pat, is in it, as well as my father. There are two folks that, that are in it. They're just wrapping that, and they're starting to um, put together the results. And what we're you know, what we kind of took away from everything is that there's more to come. Um, regardless of what those results are in the end, we're very excited because there's a lot more to come and we're very excited about that. So it seems like there's, there's uh, some progress moving if you're moving to yes. clinical trials. Is there any cooperative efforts with the other, you mentioned ALS, um, you know, ALS sometimes works with multiple sclerosis or something like yes. that on, on uh, co-research for drugs because if they're a neurological condition it may you know, it I may have a similar, or, yeah. or at least you can build off of that foundation. I don't know if you know that answer, Ed, but I do know that a lot of that basic genetic research, I think, is used and applied in a lot of these diseases across the board. So, um, from it's my understanding, in, in the study that they are in right now is a drug that is sort of a jumping, jumping off point of a drug that was developed for ALS patients. So, and that was also what was very interesting, these scientists and researchers were there days before we were as the, um, the National Ataxia Foundation community. These guys started three or four days before us. There were researchers and scientists from around the world that were attending this, collaborating yeah. and talking about what they've been seeing. Um, so yes, I think that there is a lot of collaboration and a lot of good things happening. Uh, there are two of my friends who are using this ALS drug right now to get a feeling for that. The other thing is that as you listen to the experts talk about uh, approaching this, they're saying that they think that there is a closer similarity between this and uh, Alzheimer's. Yeah. So there is a potential opportunity if they can clarify that thought that they have. There's a lot of more money in research for that. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. Open yes, up some other yes. channels. Uh -huh. Yes. And the the effort that you've been making to help us increase awareness for the set of conditions that we call ataxia will certainly help this effort. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. It's my pleasure to help you raise awareness. Is there anything that really um, got you excited coming out of this conference that you're really looking forward to? <sighs> I really, I, I, if you don't mind. Go I, ahead. I had started attending um, the National Ataxia Foundation conferences in the late 90s. 
Um, I am a part of a family who has a dominant um, form of ataxia called spinocerebellum cerebellum 3, which um, means that I am born with a 50-50% of carrying the gene. Um, I will say that out of, uh, we have a very big multi-generational Pittsburgh family, 50% um, of us basically have it. And as you can imagine over the years, that's been a very impactful thing on us. Um, so we have been trying to find studies and find research and find ways that we can be proactive about this for a long time. So in the 1990s, we started attending the conference. And I was telling Ed and Linda, I walked out of there, I haven't been in, in many years, and I walked out of that conference feeling like I've never felt before. Just seeing the amount of people, I uh. think the support community, being able to interact with a lot of different groups and organizations that want to help, and not just with the research as well. You know, there are a lot of other side effects and things that we have to worry about, like psychological effects, and um, just having that support in the community. So for me, I would say that it was just the, the increase in participation, the increase in people that are, of, of people that are aware of it, um, and just, you know, the coming together of all of that was really, I think, wonderful. It's, there were 525 people at this conference last week from all around the world. And that's Amazing. significant. Yes. That's significant. That sounds like a, a lot of momentum happening. That's a lot of so. momentum. And yeah. that's, that's, that's usually what, what you need. You know, you go yes. through a lot of years, you need something that would kickstart yeah. it again. So it's good to hear that, that uh, things are moving in the right direction again in research. Now, you said, is there anything about the conference that excited me? Right here in Pittsburgh, I've been excited that we have been able to attract their family to our group because that just expands the ability we have to get the word out. And when we started with this organization three years ago, we were the third and fourth person. My wife and I were the third and fourth person. This and we in the walk that we talk about, we, we collected $4,000 the first year. Last year, we had over 100 people, and we collected about 18,000. So that's the growth that's occurred here. And if we can continue that kind of growth across the company, country, mm -hmm. that means there'll be a, a solution soon than there would have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so that's exciting. You mentioned the walk. Um, the walk yeah. is in September typically, right? Yeah. Uh, doing it again in 2018? Yes. Uh, we have two ideas for that. One is that we recognize that we have not been able to touch the geographic area that we call Western Pennsylvania. And this year we're having it in downtown Pittsburgh. It will occur the Saturday before the 25th of September. Okay. And we do that because the 25th of September is International Ataxia Awareness Day. Uh, we have also started evaluating whether we could have something in addition in downtown Pittsburgh, oh, okay. the City of Walks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe attract uh, people from a wider geographic area from the north, east, and west and start providing a service that we are not able to provide with the size of group we have now. I think that that's the biggest um, point to, um, to what Ed is saying is that I think there are a lot more people in this area that are affected by this disease. Um, you can have it genetically, such as my family does, um, but you can also have it as Ed developed it later in life, which they don't know or haven't assessed yet to this point. They're just starting to do research on something that's more sporadic and mm -hmm. that tends to develop from, they said it could develop from a fall, um, what have you. There are many multiple things that they think could cause it, but I think that there are more people in this area that um, could possibly even benefit from being a part of this group 
and from participating in this if you think that you have any of these symptoms. If you do think you do, please visit the National Taxia Foundation's website. There are a lot of great tools there that they can provide to you in terms of assessing, you know, what are your symptoms and what do you have. Um, and to that point, you know, we came on board. We didn't know the group existed. Our family didn't. Um, and uh, as more people in my family started to find out that they had it, uh, more of us kind of banded together to see what resources were out there. And we found Ed and his wife, Linda, um, and the rest of the team um, with the Western Pennsylvania support group. We're thrilled to be helping. Um, and some other things that we've come up with aside from the walk, we're trying to figure out other ways yes, to involve yes. more people from around the area mm -hmm. to get more awareness out there that ataxia exists and, and we'd love to be there to help you as a resource. Um, but you know, uh, we are looking at other ways and one of the other things that we're doing just coming up this spring, Memorial Day weekend, we will be hosting a um, golf outing. We're going to call it our first annual golf outing. We're hoping we can make it annual. We're hoping it's a success. Um, it's going to be on the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend, which is May 26th, at um, Lakeview North um, Golf Course, which is in Butler, Pennsylvania. So we're really hoping to get more people out there, participate in that. You can um, just go onto the Ataxia uh, donor page and they'll be able to direct you there as well. And we're going to put that link up on the screen for everybody okay, so they can see Good. how to register for that golf outing. Yeah. Great. Um, and that's an event happening in north of Pittsburgh, so that, uh, we're spreading our wings. Spreading yeah. out, get, getting some more, yeah. uh, get, getting uh, out to some more people. Um, what are any other ways that uh, Pittsburghers could help you at this point? Well, tell your friends and neighbors, certainly, about us. And uh, we'll be easy to find as a result of your efforts. Uh, you call the National Taxi Foundation. They know we're here, but there are about 25 groups like ours around the country. Uh, we'd like to say five of them are ours. <laughs> uh, and we keep in close contact. There's only one other group in Pennsylvania. Uh, if anybody has any legislative contacts, we would like to do that. I've been personally talking to the governor's office, and uh, we would like to get greater support from the political community. The state of Ohio has just recently passed a piece of legislation that makes International Taxi Awareness Day a, an occurrence every year by legislative act in uh, Ohio. Uh, we'd like to see that in Pennsylvania as well. So you have, you definitely have some uh, some advocacy work ahead of you. I think yes. Definitely, we need to get some people more involved with you. Yes. So if, if you're out there, um, look them up on on the the website, and we put an email address up as well. Uh, contact them, help them get connected with the local legislation. Um, let's do Ohio one better. Uh, ALS has a line item in the state budget. Let's get a line item in for a taxi uh, as well. This is, Thank you. This is a taxi at Ohio. I don't know about an ALS, but it is a taxi. Yeah. Let's get uh -huh. a line item in for a taxi of research as well. Here, yes. Yes. And uh, anybody that has a, legis a legislative contact, have them contact us and be our partners in whatever we're doing. We'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, one final thing uh, that you'd like to leave with our guests. Um, the only other thing I think that um, I found very important and is a resource I think for um, your audience is they um, taught us at this convention that there is a coordination of rare diseases registry Yes. which um, not only is for a disease like ataxia, but many rare diseases. And the benefit of going online and looking um, to sign up for that is at no cost to you, it takes a couple of minutes to fill that out, is that you are then in a database. If you are just a family member and you're asymptomatic of something like ataxia or anything like ataxia, um, they recommend that you do this. I wanted to give them a little bit of a shout out because I think it's a wonderful resource and it really does help find folks when those research trials go to clinical study to be able to make that um, research effective. Definitely, it moves, it moves things along a lot more efficient and, and can get 
uh, through trials quicker that way and get uh, yes. and get a, uh, a cure on onto the uh, or a treatment onto the absolutely onto the marketplace faster. So definitely, it is known as cords, C O R D S. Yes. So I'd like to thank my guest today, Ed and Rini. Um, it's been great catching back up with yeah. you, Ed. Thank you for coming back on the show and, and sharing your, your progress. We'll, we are definitely following it closely and, and we'll continue to do so in the Thank future. Thank you. We appreciate that very much. He's an inspiration. He is. He is. We love having him on the show. Well, I've, I was sharing with her that we have found that sometimes people don't really relate to an organization, but they relate to us as individuals. And I have had phenomenal support from my friends, from our church, from our community, and I know you have too. And to the extent that you have friends that have any kind of a condition like this, help them. It means so much to us. Just well, to have Ed, friends. Ed, I remarked last year, and I'll say it again, you are the best spokesperson that a taxi could have. That's thank good. you so much thank you. for what you do. Thank you. I'd like to thank my guests today, Ed Schwartz and Rini Kuhlman. Uh, if you like this episode of Into Pittsburgh, and I hope you did, uh, hit that like button on Facebook or on YouTube. You can also leave us a comment. If you are interested in being on a future show of Into Pittsburgh, if you've got a great idea for how we can make Pittsburgh better, then hit me up on uh, Twitter at CS Whitlatch, pound into PGH. We just might share your idea on our next show. You can watch Into Pittsburgh on the community block uh, on PCTV on Monday nights starting at 7 p.m. We'd like to thank all the donors that make this show and others possible on PCTV. This has been Into Pittsburgh. I'm Christopher Whitlatch. Thank you.